Hello there, saints. This is your friend, Pastor Roy, speaking to you again about something of eternal significance. And that has to do with one of my favorite portions of Scripture, as found in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, where Jesus is speaking, and he's saying that as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And uh, just reviewing that in my mind, the instructions were just to look and live. Just to look at that serpent Lift it up in the wilderness. Just look. Uh, not jump, not dance, not sing, not dance around the pole. Um, not give any credit to the serpent. Or anything like that. Just look at the thing up on the pole. And Jesus equates himself being lifted up. By saying, even so, or in like manner. Uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then in the 15th verse, he continues, he says that, that as continuing on from verse 14, that even so the Son must be lifted up, continuing, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There are two things here of great interest. Number one, Jesus acknowledges that there is a reality of people perishing. Uh, that's, that's tragic, that's heartrending. If you've been around the world a little bit and uh, traveled, as I've had the privilege of doing, people are the same all over. Different customs, different um, ways of doing things, different language, different colors of skin, uh, different customs. I said that already. But they're the same. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be treated uh, with a, a, a modicum of respect. And yes, there are so-called bad people and good people in every culture and every village. By our judging standards. But the fact is that <clears throat> whether people perish or as it continues but have eternal life, the, the fulcrum, the, the trigger, the, uh, the balance uh, of going one way or another, the triangle on which the seesaw um, goes in one direction or the other is believing in Jesus. Now, Scripture does not break down what it means to believe in Jesus. You know, we have our requirements. We, we make requirements for that, you know. You've got to uh, believe, uh, you've got to have saving faith. Uh, you've got to uh, believe certain things. It's almost as though that you need to understand Isaiah 53 and all the implications of, you know, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, uh, uh, who hath believed our report, and, and, and so on. But it's not that way. Just as a serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, just look and live. Just believe and live. How much faith do you have to do that? Well, did not Jesus speak about the, the grain of a mustard seed? Now, the mustard seed is a, is a very small seed. And some people have mustard seed size faith. They have very small faith. And maybe you have very, very small faith. 
But according to my understanding of Scripture, and it seems to be very clear, it's enough. It's enough. Where you say, well, about what about mentoring? What about teaching? What about that comes later? You don't mentor or disciple unbelievers. Uh, you evangelize unbelievers. And what do we mean by that? We mean we introduce them to who Jesus is, what he did, and that he is alive and living today. It seems that's the, the lowest common denominator for believing in Jesus. It might be even more simple than that. Just look, just look, just look and live. And it goes on, for God so loved the world. Oh my God, as we travel through cities of uh, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people, uh, primarily now in the uh, Romania and the European Union, I say to God, God, how can we reach them? There are a lot of churches, magnificent cathedrals, and simple churches. We've built some of the simple ones. But it's not, uh, should I say, uh, the European Union is not being highly successful in evangelism. As a matter of fact, the, um, the Czech Republic, in which we have been, is one of the least religious countries. And part of that religious countries would have to do with simple believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They probably don't even know who he is, except a uh, expression that you use if you slam the hammer on your finger. But if, no, God passionately, deeply, why did he start this business? Why did he do the Adam and Eve thing? Why, why, why? He loved, he loved. The Bible says God seeketh such. In other words, God is looking for people. His creation, he's looking for them like a man would, would, would look for the response of um, a young lady whose affections she's trying to win. He's looking for a response. Just give me anything, but give me something. And God is looking for a response from those that he loves, those that he's created. And that response is, believe in my son. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple but profound. Not only life changing, but eternity changing. For God so loved the world that he gave, he's proved his love. How can you prove your love more than God, the creator of the, the cosmos? Incredible. Billions upon billions of galaxies. Each galaxy contains billions and billions of stars. He gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him, whoever believeth in him, should not perish. Okay? Second time that is mentioned in three ver uh, two verses. They should not perish. God does not want anybody to perish. It's just not his will. And so what is he doing? He says, whoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen to this. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. No. But that the world through him might be saved. Roy, somebody said, you make it too easy. My response was, I would like to open the gates of heaven as wide as Scripture will allow. Don't put hoops and hurdles and obstacles 
in people's way to come to the cross and look and live. Clear the pathway, clear the obstacles, just let them come and look and believe and see and live and not perish. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not on him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's like throwing the drowning man a life preserver. Grab on it. Grab it. If you don't grab it, grab it. And then once a person comes into that faith relationship with God through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the magnificent process begins where they can be mentored or discipled. And that means that they come with a lot of baggage, a lot of old habits, a lot of old Lord knows what. Just like we came. And then through the process of teaching and, uh, as I mentioned, uh, mentoring or discipling, you know, they grow to maturity and uh, along the way have these magnificent encounters with the Holy Spirit where scriptures become real and Jesus becomes real and His presence is manifested and all of these magnificent, magnificent things to come for what? So they too may uh, learn to abide in Him. Don't neglect that part. Abide in Him. It's possible to abide in Him. Jesus said, if a man abides in me, what is He saying? He's saying, that's an invitation to come and abide in Him. Don't abide in, abide in this worldly stuff of accumulating wealth and houses and cars and stuff of just decay uh, where moth and rust and canker worm devour and eat it up. You invest your eternal opportunities in that. We in Romania, you know, we thank God for a place in the harvest field. But when you look at the scope of seven billion people on planet Earth, we have a part. But God needs laborers and the fields are white unto harvest. What does that mean? That means they're ready to hear and respond and see and receive. And all they need is somebody to come, go and, and tell them. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them. Look and live. My brother-in-law Alan just came. Come say hello, Alan. How about just look and live? Hello, Alan. <laughs> okay. Brother and sister, look and live. And teach others to look and live. And easy on the rules and heavy on the grace. Grace overwhelms judgment. Mercy is greater than judgment. To be continued. God bless you.